over the years, I had to, I had to like force myself to value my own art. I like to have like a little bit of separation between that, like uh, what I do culturally and what I do for the art market. Hello. Today's guest on Tea Time with Brian Wilgen is Philip Gray or Phil Gray, whose artwork has made its way to, uh, of all things, the Olympics, which is kind of a neat story. And onto the walls of buildings, which is one of my favorites, and also many galleries highlighting his works of uh, Northwest Coast Indian artists, to name a few. His background, uh, Simshin and Cree heritage, will surely find its way into our conversation as we discuss his role as an artist and some of the beautiful works of art that he's helped bring forth. And it's kind of with that that I'd like to uh, ask the first question, which is the, uh, the kind of the background and the heritage that, that plays a part in your art. Can you describe it, please? Uh, yeah, well, mo most most of the uh, my background that I base my art off of is uh, my Tim San side, which is my mother's side, and um, that's a group of people that had territory near Prince Rupert, BC, like around that area. Um, there was there was actually a, like a, quite a few groups that were kind of they call it like Simsianic, um language group, but we had we had our own we're on the coast there and further down the Pena River. Um, there is basically what is basically all all of what I do is Simpson style. Um, I do a little bit of stuff on my father's side, but not a whole lot. I'm trying to actually incorporate it a little bit more. But yeah, um, as, as you will see with my art, um, a lot of it is like uh, form line uh, designing as well and, and masks and stuff like that. That's neat. Uh the uh, the Haida, when I think of them, I think of them also being in that area, like the uh, Queen Charlotte. Yeah, you're across the uh, water from us. Okay. And I've heard that apparently not the best of friends over time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, there, there, there's, you know, I, I think there, there was definitely like warring that went on between us. And I guess even modern day, it's just, really? I don't know. It's hard to explain. Um I had like, I was trying to explain it to some of my friends because uh, so people, you know, a lot of, have a lot of Haida friends, but we, we tend to like go in on each other a lot, like okay. really, really uh, roast each other. And um, it's hard, be it was hard for me because like there's a lot more that I was around than, than other Timsians. Uh, I, I was rather ever, ever around other Timsians, like kind of back me up. So I had to like get a sharp tongue after a while. Um, but I was, I remember we were talking about something like that with a friend of mine. And one of the things that is actually very, very, um, if, well, I think it's not, it's not just for Simpson people, but I think most of the people up and down the coast that do Northwest Coast art, uh, it's, it's, it's such a grating, uh, it's, it's a grating insult that when somebody sees your art, it's like, oh, I love Haida art. Or something like that, and then just like associates it with that, like right away. It's like it's it's not their art. It's it's like all of our art up and down the coast, right? And uh, it's just so happens that the the most famous artists come from their nation, okay. which is beautiful art. But it's uh there there are slight differences, and it's it's usually just because people don't really understand the differences and stuff. That would be me, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I enjoy form line, but I, I couldn't distinguish be, between them without somebody you know, showing me the, the differences. Yeah. I think most people too, like even a lot of uh, aspiring artists can't really tell a lot of the difference, um, especially the old pieces because they're, they're a lot closer back then than what they are now. And um, yeah, and as for even just the way that we kind of go in on each other or whatever, um, or whenever somebody gets offended, if you if you misidentify them as a certain nation, yeah, uh, I, bet, yeah. <laughs> I have uh, buddies that I grew up with who are uh, Guatemalan and Salvadorian, and oh, they didn't understand it. And I'm like, okay, well, think of if somebody just started calling you Honduran you or know? Mexican, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm sure you wouldn't be very happy about that. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm. Um. I mean, that's kind of the, the divisive side of that, but do you feel that there's a good community between all, all these different, you know, artists that are doing doing their, their work? Is it supportive? I hope. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like you said, it's it's a it's a friendly, friendly rivalry in some ways, but like for the most part, yeah, everybody just because the native the native community 
uh, as a whole on the Northwest Coast has diminished quite a bit over the last century and a half. And yeah, I think, I think well, just native population in general in, in North America uh, is pretty diminished. So when, when you're around other, just another native or, or you're, you tend to group it, you tend to group yourself in with them as, in, in a way as well. Because um, it's, uh, I had something in my head, but I completely spaced out. Um, right, but it's, I get it. you, there's like a common common uh, upbringing in a lot of ways. You know, there they, there are definitely differences between us and uh, you know nations and, and our culture, but we do have a common common uh, history that we can kind of bond bond together with. And when it comes to the Northwest Coast art, um, the community is pretty small overall uh, for the artists, and especially when it comes to a like certain certain um, tier of, an, of artists. So there's a lot of camaraderie uh, with with all of us. Okay. We're all big fans of each other, and you know, pump each other's tires all the time. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that because some things people take a little too competitively and seriously. And I'm not saying you don't take them seriously. And maybe there's a little competitive edge there. You'd like to do something that's, you know, really nice. But at the end of the day, it's nice to hear that it's a supportive environment. So, you know, you'd be helping somebody else out when they need it. I mean, there are people, you know, there's always going to be a group of people that are, yeah, you know, or I don't know, just haters I guess or whatever but for the most part yeah like uh, I know just about every artist like like every artist like in my kind of uh kind of group in a way um we every time we meet each other it's like a, it's great because it's, it's it's um it's rare you get to have a conversation with somebody who lives your life you know, like, especially with somebody who's been doing it as long as you have or at the, at the level that you have been doing it, you know that that person lives the same life as you for the most part. Okay. And it's very, it's very different overall because being an artist is like, oh, it's, it's, it's odd, you know, because you have, you have a lot of freedom. You dictate your own hours, you do all this kind of stuff. And I get that a lot with a lot of people. It's like, oh my God, what a life. You get to just do whatever you want, wake up whenever you want. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. But I also don't really have weekends or holidays. You know, I don't really think of them that way. You know, it's just every now and then I'll take a day off or whatever. And some, some, not so much anymore, but like in my earlier days, I would, I think I was averaging like 12 hours a day uh, carving. Okay. A good solid 10 years. And it's just something I had to do because you got to like survive in this market. You got to like produce and and progress. Uh, I'm amazed your hands didn't cramp up after 12 hours of uh, doing the carving. So uh, that's uh, in the your 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 muscles uh, your muscles learn. They, they they get used to it. And that's kind of going to bring me to my other question, which is basically how did you get started? Because my um, by looking into your background a little bit for this interview, it kind of showed me that, you know, this wasn't something you started out when you were really young. So kind of what drew you to it and how did you get going? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, kind of jumping back a little bit. I'll just go quickly into my father's side. Sure. Uh, so I'm Mikasu Cree on that side. So that's in the northern region of uh, Alberta in a place called Fort Chippewyan. And um, yeah, we're considered uh, Woodlands Cree. But my father, yeah, he came from over there. Anyways, so growing up, my mother, um, she she grew up in Vancouver um, mo most of her life. She she was born in Prince Rupert, but she grew up in Vancouver. Uh, lost my grandmother uh, when she was like thirteen, so she was kind of going through some of the uh, the the. Um, foster care system and all that kind of stuff. And then also got, went with, with her older brother uh, for a while until kind of, I guess she got to an age enough where she kind of be on her own. But since then, especially even when her mother was alive, there wasn't a lot of uh, culture being passed on because of um, her time like with residential school and like just overall 
Yeah, so um, my grandmother didn't have a lot, didn't really have any real connection with their culture growing up. So she didn't pass any of that on to my mother or her, any of her siblings. So when she grew up in Vancouver, um, she knew we were Sim San. Um, pretty much all she really knew about it. I think the only other thing knew she knew was that we're Kilowell clan. Um, but that was pretty much it. Um, so for the most part, most of the culture that I was uh, exposed to growing up was my dad's side. So like powwows and whatnot from from over in Alberta or whenever we went to any kind of event in Vancouver, it was usually a powwow. Until I was about 12, I went to my first potlatch over in Alert Bay, um, got to understand like what West Coast culture was really about. And when I was growing up a little bit, I, I used to draw quite a bit and they copy, copy like comic books and whatnot. Um, and my uncle, uh, my oldest uncle, he, he was a carver or he still is a carver. What do you mean? He was a carver. He was, he carved around like a lot of really great artists as well. And he was somebody I always wanted to teach me, but he was kind of a drifter. So he would come in and out and really, really wouldn't stay long enough to really show me anything. Plus I just wasn't ready at the time. He tried to like get me to start out drawing and I just wanted to carve. You know, and I was probably like 12 or 13 at the time. And he's just like, oh, you should draw this, copy these designs first. And, you know, I get really bored of it really fast. And it's like, I obviously wasn't ready for it. So, you know, it was all good. But we grew up in, um, I grew up in a native housing co-op in uh, East Van. And we, they, one of the residents uh, got some funding for a, a totem pole to get carved and raised to be put up in front of the uh, co-op there. So they hired my first teacher. Uh, his name is Jerry Sheena. And my mom just kind of told me, like, you apply for this. You know, you always want to carve. This is your chance. So it's like, OK. It's cause, So it, it was basically a summer job because they got money enough to pay the apprentices. And, um, yeah, so I spent three months of the summer there and uh, got to learn learn the ropes a little bit at 15. I wasn't very good after all of that, but it was uh, it was a nice introduction. What is this uh, family cooperative? What is that? Oh, um, so there's, I guess, you're, you're, where are you in the States? Oh, we're down in Texas now. Oh, okay. I, I guess the best way I could explain it is like maybe projects. Uh, okay, so not exactly the nicer part of Vancouver then. Yeah, definitely not. We're we're actually in the better, actually, you know what? It, it was slightly better part of East Van that I grew up in. Yeah. So we weren't in the, the really bad projects, but we were definitely in the projects. It wasn't the best place to grow up in. Like, you know, there were shootings in my neighborhood and all that kind of stuff, but not not super crazy. Like it is Canada, and you know, there wasn't a ton of it. That's hilarious. So, okay, so you got started at 15 doing the, this uh, summer project. How did they have you go about learning that? Did, did they start you out with the form line like your uncle was doing? or how No, not at all. Um, so it was just for a totem pole because like he had a job to do. So me and my friend Louis were uh, hired on as the apprentices. So we are just essentially we're just hired labor, laborers at the beginning because we had no discernible skills whatsoever. So it, it, like the best way to do it is he would just make like these score cuts on the log and we had to like lop them off and then use a planer and kind of get it all prepped. And then, yeah, for the most part, it's just like him making a lot of score cuts with a chainsaw and us kind of chiseling it off or whatever. Um, okay. Eventually he gave us like a uh, little small set of, he made us a small set of knives and got us to like carve and stuff. It was mainly... Like knowing now, like further down the road, it was like he was giving us a lot of busy work because there were times where he probably didn't really have anything for us to do because we just would have we would have messed it up. So he got us to like carve all these like little paddles out of some of the spare red cedar that were supposed to go for a giveaway when we eventually uh, raised the totem pole, but we never did anything with them. So he carved like a little over a hundred paddles for nothing, okay. and then. Um, but what he ended up doing was he got us to carve some plaques. And so he would design them up and then he'd get us a car, like just carve out the designs and stuff. So we get used to the knives. So that was, um, yeah, that was 
good, I think, especially at 15, because I, I had no clue what I was doing. I was terrible at it. And yeah, knowing now it's like, because I've had some people kind of asking me to teach their, their child might be like 12 years old or something. And I just kind of tell them like, I'll teach them how to design, but I, I really don't think it's a good idea for them to carve until they're like maybe 15. And you think that's maybe like an emotional maturity type of thing or, or to find out whether they actually want to go down that way or, or what? I think it's emotional maturity. And it's also, I think when you're about 15, you're, you're a good few years into puberty and you start getting more of a man, like a more of a uh, adult body for the most part. Right. And you, yeah, you're able to kind of handle these things because there's a lot of stress on the hands and, just body overall to to learn how to carve and um yeah i don't know man like i i I think about that like when i was 12 i don't know if i would have done very well as trying to learn how to carve i think that's a a great point i'm amazed at how many different things in life are appropriate at certain points um if you tried those you know a year or two before or after maybe you know you have a completely different outcome so absolutely well, one of one of the main things too is um, when when you first start out. Um, I don't know if you have ever tried carving before. Um, so holding the knife um, when you when you're slicing or you're cutting, um, there's a certain tension and certain way that you hold it in, in order for you to get a good cut. Um, when you're starting out, you have no idea what that is. So you're just like going in there and you're trying to like struggle through, and usually that. When you when you don't know how to cut properly, and you don't have the the, the muscle memory or the the stability to, to keep it in that in that angle or whatever, um, or with that tension, you end up like slipping or freaking going all over the place, and that's when you end up slicing yourself up. And I got plenty of cuts because I was just, yeah, it was it was pretty bad. Like, and not to say I don't cut myself now. I, I actually cut myself twice within like an hour like pretty good like one of my thumb when i was sharpening oh, no. i was sharpening and go like this and then i for some reason i think i moved my hand and i went back at the same time and i just sliced the hell out of my thumb and oh. then i sliced the uh, my middle finger reaching for something like like less than an hour later i, I was reaching for something around that same knife and i put a nice little thing in my in my finger there so most of mine are like non, like <laughs> they're not carving related. Um, but in the early years, I, I think you need to have a certain amount of uh, stability, like with with your with your body. Like you got to know, you got to have like a somewhat of an adult body. I think. I mean, my only woodworking experience has to do with lathes and things like that. Um, it's my dad that carves like little uh, Santa Claus figurines and other things. Um, so he could probably understand what you're, you're talking about as to the the feel for doing it. Um, but it, it makes me laugh that you still cut yourself even today. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Not, not like all the time, but yeah. Right. So, uh, okay. I see, I see how you, you've, I, I mean, my understanding is that you're, you're mostly well known for carving. I mean, it's kind of most of the, the artwork I've seen, I, I mean, prints and some other stuff, but I, carving. So I, I see how you got started in carving how do you go about the process of of bringing one of these designs into the the beautiful finished product i mean how do you visualize that and go through it um nowadays it's just a lot of like you just kind of sketch something out um i used to be able to wood? yeah just not on the piece well actually i used to do it on the piece um when i was younger and that's just because like you know you're, you're kind of new to design and you haven't exhausted all the different variations that you can do do on there. So it's just like a ton of freedom and a ton of creativity. So I could just, I've never done this type of connection before. I've never done this before. So I'm just doing it. And um, yeah, so I would just do it on a piece and I was impatient. I wanted to get stuff done quickly as well. So I would just do it right then and there. And also it was like a little bit of pride as well. Cause I was very proud of the fact that I could design very fast and do a decent job at it. Looking back, they're not the greatest, but now um, I've been doing this close to 23 years, something like that. So I've done a lot of, lot of designing and 
I'm not saying I've done it all, but at a certain point, you could only you could only put an eagle together in so many ways, and the more you do that, the more you try to like find a new way or a slightly different way to like put an eagle together in a design, you eliminate these all. Like uh, for me, uh, I know a lot of, some people have no problem with this, but I just don't like having to copy myself or do the same design. So I'm essentially eliminating a, a, a design that I can do. So it's getting harder and harder because I'm trying not to copy myself. So I'm sitting there just kind of scratching my head, looking at the paper, messing around with a few quick little squ like scribbles to get the flow and see if, um, if I could land on anything that might be good. And quite often nowadays, I just kind of walk away from it for a little while then come back to it, walk away, come back kind of. Sometimes it takes like a couple months for me to actually land on something because, which is not too bad because I'm usually working on a couple other things at the same time. So I just will, if I, if I, if it's not too immediate, I, I'll just like give myself a little bit of breathing room. Which to me is amazing because that uh, also matches up with um, like books on, on learning processes and stuff like that. They actually recommend that you have, you know, multiple projects and that you, you, um, you work on them and then you give them some time because I, I think your unconscious kind of works on it while you're off doing something else. It's kind of doing the math in, in there and you don't realize it. And all of a sudden something pops out of there and you're like, oh, wow, that's really neat. Yeah. Now, when you do it on paper, um, do you use computers at all? Is this computer um, drawn or this is just you know, hand drawn onto the paper and then transferred to the, the wood itself? Uh, sometimes on paper, sometimes on my phone. Well, on your phone? Yeah, I got a. I got. I. I. I, I uh, started buying the uh, Note series in uh, Samsung Samsung phones, and anyways, they're the only ones with stylus that you could actually do anything with. So you could get this like program, and it's just like Procreate or whatever, and you could do a lot of designs on there. Zoom in, kind of that doesn't register your hand at all, so it's just taking uh, input from the from the stylus. So you can kind of sit there and draw there pretty well. Wow. Okay. And yeah, that's amazing. I, I never thought that would be part of your design process. So it eventually cool. did. Like it was great because I hate, well, I don't like designing so much anymore. <laughs> like just kind of randomly. Um, yeah. It's just not, uh, I kind of maybe, you know, in the early days, you just really love it because it's it's new, creative. It's challenge. It's, it's uh, challenging you a little bit. Now it's like challenging in a different way, and it's not not in a fun way. Like I was just explaining my process of having to like put it down and whatever. So, just designing for the fun of it. Um, I haven't been doing so much. Maybe I should, because most of the time I just I'm just designing for projects. Um, but what I did like about this phone is it pretty much eliminated me having to carry around a sketchbook and a pencil. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then how do you take it from your phone and then put it onto the piece of wood? Do you print it off on a, a whatever size you know, sheet to, to match the wood or, or how do you yeah, try? I, I always freehand it on, onto the actual project. Oh, okay. So that gets you your, your design outline of what you'd like to do. And then you take that and you, yeah, so sometimes what I'll do, especially if it's a bigger piece, um, like I did this five foot panel last year, and I got the design I wanted, but I wanted like, I want to make sure that I got all the measurements right, got and um, whatever. So I just kind of did like a, um, I just drew lines, you know, perpendicular, and just kind of did some cross lines and whatever. And then what I would do is I would zoom in on a section, and then I'd use a, a ruler. Um, I'd zoom in until it got to the point where the, it, it, it matched a certain measurement that I could multiply to the actual okay. length of the panel. And then I would draw the exact same lines on the panel and then I would just kind of make marks and stuff. And then I, then I draw it on there as I go. Because <laughs> one thing too is uh, it's a, it's a bit difficult. Sometimes it just doesn't translate well when you draw it on a small scale. Um, some things look a little bit better when it's that small, but when you actually get up on there and it, the flow doesn't quite match. So that's why you have to do like, you know, little revisions. 
Okay. So even though you've designed it, it's still not your final design. It's kind of being adjusted as you go in and step back and maybe look at it and see whether you like oh, it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for carving projects. Um, all my designs are never final. <laughs> I was just thinking about your designs because you said you, you do them all original because you don't want to repeat the stuff. And to me, it sounds like you're um, at the plateau phase of like a, a learning curve where like it requires a lot more effort and work to get that little bit of incremental improvement. And yes. That doesn't sound like fun to anybody, but I, I think it'd be amazing to see what comes out of it though. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's incremental for sure, but it's great when it's like a, like a portion of my carving that kind of brings kind of brings it to the next level in, in some way, you know? Um, yeah, I feel personally, like I feel like it, it makes a huge difference, even though it's like really small. Like I try to explain it to friends or something, they're like, oh, okay, <laughs> I have no clue. But for me, like it makes a lot of, like it means a lot, a lot more than it would to anybody else. Okay, and maybe to a fellow carver with like 23 years of experience. Oh yeah, yeah like, exactly. oh, I get what you're doing, okay. Yeah, but see that that's one of the things I really love about talking with other carvers is that somebody will come up and be like, Oh my god, I love that thing you did on that yeah. last thing. You know, they talk about this one little section of it or something like that. I'm like and and it just so happens to be like the hardest part of that panel I had to do or whatever piece I had to do. And I just knew like, you know, um I only did it because I, I you know, I can't let myself not do it, you know, not I don't wanna like um I don't want to like just kind of cheap out a little bit. So I forced myself to do it. And then I'm like, nobody's ever going to recognize that. So whenever I do come into contact with another artist and they're like, they see exactly that. I'm like, oh, thank you. My people. <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. Well, in relation to your carving, we're, we're ultimately discussing form line. Can you tell people what that is and kind of give a, a description of it? Form line? Yeah, I, mean, I know we'll show some visual elements of stuff you've done, but um, yeah, how would somebody recognize it? I guess. Um, ooh, it's kind of difficult without visually showing it. I know. <laughs> yeah, I guess like so. Like the main, the main um, form that we use as a part of our form line is called the ovoid, and the shape of that would be something like the cross section of like a sourdough loaf or something you know like if you if you look at that that's like a pretty good ovoid um and then the the so there's very very few elements that that actually go into it a lot of it is just modifications on certain elements so, so when it really comes down to it most of it's just ovoids and and u shapes so it's something that you connect onto an ovoid um so you'd have this kind of like almost like a, a loaf to a jelly bean, jelly bean shape. And then you'd have this kind of U shape that comes off the side of it or coming off of, of the bottom. And that's a, that's pretty much the basis of a lot of like what we do. Um, it's just a lot of tinkering around. And then when you, when you do the actual form line, they call it like this. Some people call it like the skeleton of the design. <clears throat> you have like, um, like the solid, black or whatever color you end up using it using it for you have that but there's a certain amount of consistency that you gotta you gotta play with when you're doing it so that there's um continuity in the design overall and then um within that there's going to be negative space and usually the in the u shapes and the ovoids that's where you have your secondaries which usually ends up being another ovoid or a u shape okay yeah and I forget what you call them. Are they, uh, Bill Reed, uh, what are they trout heads or salmon heads? They're kind of like the introductory yeah. form that you'd learn how to draw. Yeah. Okay, oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's what form line looks like. And what I think is amazing about that is you look at the size of it and from having sketched those myself and, and was terrible at it, I might add. But you're right. You have a limited amount of kind of shapes to draw from a pull from, is my understanding. But I can't get over how many different ways you can do that one thing that you have to add to it on your arm there. It's it's absolutely surprising to me. Oh, yeah. 
no, it's um that that one figure is <clears throat> I've been obsessed about that forever. That's the reason why I have it on my arm. Because these are um damn it, I can't really get a good look. Are but these are uh, four yeah, four different artists that mm -hmm. have done it. So the idea is is that um not the idea, but my the way I look at it is it's uh every artist does it their own way. They have kind of like almost a signature, right? So I kind of want their signature style of that form on my kind of like they, they, I think eventually I wanted to get a lot more, but I just kind of stopped at four. I just kind of looked good as well. But that 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 has always been a thing to me because one, it is a very prominent thing in our designs. You see it all over the place, like within most of our designs. Um, uh, two, it is a signature. It, it feels like it anyway uh, of the artist because they do it that specific way. Not that specific way because we all change it up a little bit, but there's always something that's very unique to that to that artist. And then three is it's like the it's the um, it's the form our form uh, of design all wrapped up into like one little egg. So when I try to teach people how to design, um, this is one of the ones that I always stress to them. It's like, this is like the most important thing for you to learn because you could base so much off of like what you're doing here, especially when it comes to the heads of the animals. Yeah, and we'll, we'll show some examples of your, your carvings later and it'll be very evident. Um, for people who aren't, aren't into carving or, or into drawing, the only thing I could think of to compare it to would be like, say, musical instruments, like say a guitar. I mean, you you could give the same guitar to Santana, you know, John Mayer, whoever, and you'd end up getting a, you know, a different thing, sound out of it, despite the fact that it's the same, you know, notes and everything else. Yeah. Just that little thing that makes it, you know, theirs, which I think is neat. And I, I didn't realize that about the form line that you could actually distinguish and, and notice that they had a, a style to, and that actually uh, leads to this question. Our, are, are there traditional colors? Because when I normally see these, I normally see them like red, black, and um, I guess white on there sometimes too. Um, are there traditional cultures and do these vary by um, groups or or was it open to interpretation? I think a lot of it's open to open to interpretation. It might to, it might also have to do with like what was available at the time, depending on who who does what. Like you see with like the Kokakiwak. Um, they have just about every color on the color wheel that you can find in a lot of their art. Mm. Um, I don't know if they had that available available to them before, but eventually they did have it available to them through contact. So certain certain colors like orange and um, yellow and whatnot, I think maybe came through contact. I'm not totally sure, but that ended up becoming such a big part of their of their culture after a while. Or their style specifically. Um, we go further up north. It, you don't see a whole lot of variation. You got black and red, white, and then um, you'd have like a bluish green, and there'd be like kind of a very variety of kind of bluish greens up and down the coast. But other than that, not a whole lot. I, yeah, it, but it. But for some reason, it, it always seemed to be like just between that or that and like kind of a copper, like a copper oxide kind of green. Mm -hmm. I ask because I'm just used to seeing like the red and black and I, and I think it really stands out. And it's very visual. And I like it. Do you happen to know what was used to make those certain colors back then? That I don't know. I'm, okay. uh, yeah, I'm actually pretty ignorant when it comes to that. And I'm really curious to see what they use to to come up with those colors because it's not like they could just pop down to the Sherwin Williams store and <laughs> yeah. yeah order up whatever. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and take a look at your uh, panels. I think that's a nice place to start. Uh, and we'll go ahead and start with that uh, one that actually just incorporates black with uh, the wood. The one we were talking about um, in the beginning. First of all, can you tell us what that is and then kind of um, how you came to that? Okay, so that is a group of um, gray whales bubble net feeding. And bubble nets where they blow the bubbles kind of um, 
Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah they kind of make like a funnel and corral the, the school of fish up to the surface and they all come up and their 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 noses breach and so it's supposed to be kind of it's supposed to be kind of like represent that a little bit that's neat okay and, and i noticed for the um the the empty spaces you, you left it a natural wood color yeah okay yeah yeah that 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 was um and the reason why it's not very easy to like interpret is is very um intentional because the yeah because the um person that commissioned it uh he had a very specific request that he he doesn't want to be able to recognize what it is essentially really so okay. yeah so i thought i understood what he was talking about and i ended up coming up with a sketch of a design that i wanted to do but he's like okay yeah it's cool but you know it's it was still kind of like a form in itself and it was it was like a little bit the balance wasn't right for him and stuff so i was just like oh god i mean fine i'll try something else uh but i ended up really loving it because i i love that kind of freedom as well too like that a bit of a test to try something that is something but it can look like absolutely nothing Okay. And I think that would be the difference between doing it as an artist for sale versus for a commission, which I can only imagine how uh, frustrating a commission might be because you draw this thing out and you like it and you want to do it. And then maybe like, you know, this, they wanted, they saw it a little differently. So. Yeah. And, you know, like in the end, I actually do want that kind of feedback. Um, in the moment, I'm just, I'm a bit, I'm just like annoyed because like, you know, yeah. Okay. You know, I got to rechange. Like, you know, either redraw the whole thing or change something, something up a little bit about it. So, like for instance, I have this door that I did, and it was just like an eagle and a killer whale. And I had the killer whale in a certain way um, that the client didn't like, and he just kind of said, like, you know, I, I'm just really not feeling that. I really apologize. Blah blah blah. Um, could we do something different? I'm like, oh, I was really kind of annoyed, but I was like, you know, okay, I'll give it a shot. Um, maybe I'll try something different. And then I came up with something that I didn't really have to even change much of the uh, eagle part of the de of the design. I just had to like replace the killer whale, and I was able to do it, and it looked way cooler. So, so sometimes it turns out to be pretty good. Okay, that's that's neat. Um... On this panel, what's kind of a, a timeline? How long does it take to go from, um, hey, I'd like you to make something to, here you go? Uh, it really depends on which kind of part of my life you're, you're reaching me at, I guess. Okay. So if, like sometimes I'm like insanely busy or, okay. you know, if you get me at the, at the perfect time where I'm just finishing up a project and I don't really have anything like immediate, then I can probably get on it pretty quickly. But yeah, like uh, I'll talk to them, go back and forth for like a month. Um, then maybe I'll mess around with the sketch here and there for two or three weeks or something. And then, yeah, usually usually takes about that long for either me to kind of be happy with the sketch and something that I want to do. And then also um, have them happy with it as well. But most of the time people are like pretty much just willing to go with whatever I've come up with like immediately um and then the actual process it really it really varies also i can't really say how long that took compared to now because i'm a lot slower now so okay maybe it'd be like a month and a half or something i don't so, know so we're talking roughly maybe three months give or take to uh to, to bring this to uh fruition then yeah okay and when you think about it from from my end as a person who would you know potentially buy it, I mean, not only are you paying for your three months of time and everything, you're also basically paying for that twenty three years of combined knowledge and experience. And, and yes. And so, so when you look at the price tag, you know, kind of divide it out by that. And, yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's a. Um, yeah. It's a. Uh... Interesting. I get a lot of clients sometimes that, or not, they're not even clients, just people who are inquiring about pieces and some people will, like wondering why it's so expensive or could you just do this or whatever. And sometimes I'll 
I'll be out of their price range, but they want something similar. So I'm like, okay, well, I could I have somebody who's kind of kind of uh, newer to it, but he's pretty good, and I can actually help him. Like I'm like I even try to like make it happen for them because I I don't know why, but so I'll be <laughs> like, you know, I can actually help him kind of because they're looking for something specific to like what I do. So like kind of like those layered panels and stuff that not a lot of other artists do. So I can't wait to they want something that. like that. Pardon me. Yeah, I can't wait to discuss the one at Telus Gardens. That's that's going to be an interesting one. Yeah. So so I'll you know I'd suggest to them like you know like maybe you go with this person. They're they're probably about my half my price, or maybe a little bit lower. Um, and I could actually help them out with it. So I'll, you know make sure that it actually turns out pretty good. So they agree to it, but then they're like, kind of get really discouraged because the person's not on my level. And it's like, yeah, they're not on my level because, like, you know, like they, they're just starting out. That's the whole reason why they're affordable for you, which yeah. is, you know, I like, I really wish I, you know, I could like accommodate people, but um, over the years, I had to, I had to like force myself to value my own art at the, like where it should be. And I can't really like vary from that. Okay. And I bet that was difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in that case, we'll uh, we'll discuss the one you, you said it was the shark with the uh, the seal on it. Now, this one uh, differs from the previous one, and we'll put the uh, the clip of it in here. In that, the colors differ. Um, in, in addition, obviously, the uh, the art itself. Can you describe this piece? So, um, along with that one panel, uh, usually with panels and stuff. Um, I will actually not let's dial back a little bit. Uh, I kind of went through a phase where I didn't really want to have stories involved with my art. Mm -hmm. um, and I still kind of don't, I don't really want to have too much of my like, um, like cultural history or whatever to be completely involved in like every aspect of my art, just because I feel like I started feeling like one, um, I like to have like a little bit of separation between that, like uh, what I do culturally and what I do for the art market. So I don't want my culture to be the absolute selling point for, for my art. Um, I would like people just to, to see my art and love it and want to buy it for the most part. Right. Mm -hmm. So I started to dial back um, having certain stories involved in it or, or whatever. Or, or I would just pick out like a snippet of a, of, of a certain part of the story that was very intriguing to me that I could like capture. Um, but it didn't really have to do with the whole story overall. So with that one, it had nothing to do with any story. It's just, have you ever seen like Shark Week and you see a great white shark breaching? Have you ever seen that? They're, they're going for a seal and they just come flying out of the uh, ocean. And they're like, they do like a backflip essentially as they're doing it. And they got a freaking seal in their mouth and they're completely out of the water at some points. Um, so that's what it's supposed to be. So the way it's like situated, you see the, the, the shark kind of uh, arcing backwards with his like, like upside down in a way. And then you got the seal kind of like in there in the middle. Okay. Yeah. In this, you use the color, it's kind of that grayish color that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, so it's supposed to be a great white shark. And therefore the gray. Okay. Could you could you have done that with a different color or did you, you thought the gray, you know, really helped it? Uh, for what I wanted to do, um, I think it kind of did. Okay. I don't know. Like, um, I don't think I've ever, have I ever done a shark? I think just because I, f it was, it's a nice way to differentiate from like a killer whale or something as well. Okay. If you just do like the basic uh, black and red. It's sometimes people look at it and they differentiate from like a salmon or a killer whale or something. So, okay. um, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, I just kind of wanted to do something that was like more relatable to the actual animal. All right. And, and, and for somebody who's not familiar with these, I mean, when you, you look at them, I mean, yeah, I get that in real life, an orca and a, a shark and all a salmon look, you know, nothing alike, right? But in, in form line and in, in the shape and everything, uh, 
they're, they're overlapping, you know, parts of it that make it a little harder to see. I mean, you can see the, I think the, the face and the teeth area look different. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, I, I could see how that would be a little confusing. It, and again, also in birds too. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, absolutely. So, and then this third one I thought was really neat just because I, I'm not used to seeing panels without um, uh, added colors to them. And, and this this third one is this really nice one that you said was a, a clam. Uh, can you tell us yeah. a, about that piece? So I had like a duo show uh, with Coast People's Gallery back in 2012. And I was just trying to come up with some really cool ideas. Um, initially, I, I did this concept on a rattle. So it had like a shell on one side and a human face on the other. So I, uh, I, it's like a lot of it's just me trying to like kind of show off in a way, I guess. Like uh, I want to try something really cool that looks very difficult and essentially almost trying to impress other, car, uh, other artists in a way, right? Mm -hmm. So I like the, the difficulty of it. So essentially you're just getting these like layers like very small layers, but they're, they're stepping down as they go and then have the design be continuous throughout, throughout it and try to have it look, look like it's completely continuous. Like as if it, you know, I don't know. Like, I don't know if you could see it, but it's scallop. Like, what, no, it's not scallop. It's a, uh, yeah, it's like step down per, per ring. Yeah. It, it does appear to have uh, rings now that you say that. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. There, there, there is like like a little like a little step down at at each one of those like kind of rings um, as it goes. So it's like a it's, a, it's a, like a layer down as it goes up. So if I am looking at this in person, is it um, flat or does it visually? It's, it's, do it's a kind of domed over. So it's domed over, and then it's got those kind of like uh, kind of little steps going as it goes. Okay, so if you were to look at this, you would actually notice it getting thinner as it went down towards the the bottom is that correct yeah I mean, you should not a lot but you know some yeah okay. that's neat and what um what was it that drew you to not putting uh, uh, additional colors on there because I, I really like just the, the natural color to it uh i just i just kind of wanted to i don't know i think a uh, part of it was the wood was wasn't the best it was a little bit uh like the 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 wood color matching wasn't the best when it came came to that uh specific panel because you got to laminate um boards together essentially for that right oh okay no i didn't know that all right oh, okay. yeah, yeah so all my panels yeah basically all my panels are all laminated wood so you got like six inch boards that you just laminate together because you can't really get because we, we deal in like uh, edge green uh, red cedar. And um, generally the smallest panels I'll do is like 30 to 36 inches uh, wide. And it, it's, man, in order to get like a perfect sheet of uh, wood with all edge grain, you'd have to cut down, a, like say, say it's 36 inches. You'd have to cut down a tree that's like nine feet diameter. <laughs> Yeah. Essentially. All right, I got you. I, I didn't realize that those were put together that way. I, I for some reason, thought they were a, a solid uh, sheet of wood. So that's really mm -hmm. neat. Okay, and then okay. So these first three have all been circular and um, the thirty-six inches or, or so. But this fourth one I thought was really neat because I'm used to seeing panels that are again circular, and this this fourth one is rectangular. Is that um, I guess move backwards here. Panels when you create them, it, is there any shape um, like that was traditionally used, or did they differ? Uh, well, traditionally, like the shape was like usually with boxes, right? Um, so rectangles, or yeah, mostly rectangles okay. is, is like the, the main medium, like a uh, main main kind of canvas you'd be working with for the most part. Uh, so when you end up getting hand drums, yeah, you, then you'd have a, a circle there. Um, but overall, there's not like panels is, is a very modern thing. Um, that's not something that would have been done back in the day. Like you would have like a large screen, maybe, 
you know, like uh, something that you could put at the back of the big house that can represent your family and stuff. Uh, other than that, you don't have a lot of like that type of relief carving for just something that's not utilitarian. Okay. Okay, so a little more on the functional side than in the everyday, okay, use. Back in the day. Um, other things that you do is like, well, not carving wise, you do like painting on like, you, they generally paint on pretty much anything. So like house fronts and stuff. So okay, there's not really a whole lot of limits. We'll kind of save the uh, the rec rectangular discussion because you have a, a really nice door that you made, which we'll we'll get to a little later. And I think it'll fit into there. Um, in addition to your panels, you, you do some really amazing masks, uh, which I think my dad would absolutely love. Um, the first one I, I would like to to hear your take on is the the one that looks like the the human face uh, with uh, some lines on it. Oh, with the uh, kind of the silhouette or not the silhouette, the uh, kind of half shadowed face. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that one was, it's called uh, pattern, pattern visions. So there's a, a few different things that came, came with that. One of it is like kind of my, my, uh, ad, my admiration of uh, weavers because the, the pattern on the, on the cheek is a uh, raven's tail uh, weaving. I don't know if you know what Raven's Tale weaving is. Um, when you, if you get a chance, you could kind of Google that. It's uh, really, it's it's a beautiful type of weaving. But the one that's like the main one is like Chill Cat. And I've done Chill Cat kind of designs on faces before. And it's it's a lot more complex. Um, and I just like the geometric uh, kind of fine lines that came with this type of weaving. So, yeah, I decided to do that. I thought it would look good because this is around the time, too, where I... I I did almost, I never really did any color. I was just mainly doing black and like just black. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do something that looked like nice and elegant. Um, and that would be like the main thing there. I wouldn't do anything else on the, the rest of the face. And then I had her eyes closed. Like she's like kind of dreaming or having a vision or something like that and coming up with like weavings. Um, the other thing is, is uh, my mom, she she went through a a weird period where she would have migraines, but they weren't migraines as in like you know you have like a throbbing pain or anything like that. She would get these weird uh, visuals of like like almost she would the way she explained it was like almost like a raven's tail, and it would completely mess with her sight, so she wouldn't actually be able to see. It would happen while she's driving sometimes. It'd be really scary where she had to like pull over and kind of like chill out and stuff. And she didn't know what it was until she went to a doctor and they're like, you know, what? I think you had a migraine. And she's like, what are you talking about? And then kind of showed her some research on it and talked about like how a lot of people have that same kind of experience. Wow. No, I had no idea. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, well, I, cause yeah, when I think of migraines, you just think of really horrible pain that you, you get that disables you. I, I didn't realize it could mess with your vision. And yeah, happened to a friend of mine, um, his wife, uh, out of nowhere and makes total sense that she would have migraines because she's just like we're a crazy crazy super mom that does so much um, but she started seeing like this weird almost like acid trippy type of uh, rainbowish colors no kidding. and the only thing that he's telling me about that and they're kind of freaking out I'm like the only thing I'm thinking like dude I think she might be having a migraine and he's like, what? what are you talking about? Migraine? She doesn't have a headache. And I'm like, no, no, no. I had to explain the whole thing. He's like, oh, oh, okay. Well, yeah, I don't know. And then the next day I went, went back there. He's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, it was a migraine. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it'd be, after this uh, interview, there's going to be people out there trying to get migraines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's really wild. When you see this picture, is it a, a, a lighting effect or is that the way they act? Oh, mask looks in person in that. Uh, sorry, in, in that you've oh. got a dark side and a, a light side. Is that just no, no, no? It's a lighting effect. It is. A lighting um, effect. I think I turned. I was taking. I was messing around with my phone for the pictures and uh, turned off the lights in a certain way and only had one specific light. And then I think I just messed around with the uh, with the shadowing, like post post photo. Um, I don't know. I just really liked it because it reminded me of Apocalypse Apocalypse Now. 
<laughs> okay, <laughs> with a, a weaving connection to, to it. Yeah. All right. I'll have to look up that type of weaving. It's, it, it's a really neat piece. I liked it. So I'm glad we could discuss that. The, uh, the one I'm also looking at is, um, you see this in a lot of uh, artwork, the, the moon appears, and you have a, a mask that is the moon, I believe. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Can you describe that one? So that one um, I did for another show. That was close to 2012. I think it's 2011. And anyways, it was just, it was basically um, supposed to be a lunar eclipse. So you ever seen a lunar eclipse? It's just this, it's oh. just this uh, spherical red, like blood red or red oxide looking kind of shape coming over the moon over the course of the like the night or something like that. And it's really trippy, just trippy to see. I don't know if you've ever seen it. You know, it's funny. I, I looked at it, but I wasn't looking at it that closely. And I, I didn't realize the red was um, signifying an eclipse on it. Mm hmm. That's really wild. That's neat. Is there uh, a reason why there's always a, a face in the symbol of the moon? Do you happen to know? Or See that? Feeling yeah, state? I don't know. I just, um, yeah, I don't really know. Because, I mean, you always seem to see a face in it. It's never just a, a blank space. Well, I think sometimes people back in the day kind of just... Um, saw saw it as like an entity itself like a supernatural being or a, or a person or whatever like there's some sort of connection so i can see that like a lot of and it's not always specifically like you're just if you're putting out like a if that's a part of your crest um and part of some story that you're doing that you're doing as a, like a performance it's not going to go over very well if you just got this big kind of half half uh, sphere <laughs> with a bunch of pox in it, right? So, uh, kind of having a connection to like uh, to to the human aspect of of our of our culture, or or same thing we did with like a lot of other masks, especially up north. Um, a lot of our um, animal masks. Not all of them, but quite a bit of them have like a lot of humanistic features as well, and sometimes that had to do with like the connection that we had had to them, and like the idea of like transformation and stuff. Interesting. Okay, I, and I, I guess I mean it, it is a mask, so I guess it would have been worn. Um, and, and this is like during a, a story or a ceremony. Then is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, that yeah. Most of the masks I do now. Uh, aren't aren't meant for that really they're just kind of what's that to be put up on a wall or something like that yeah me. yeah that's what they're meant to be yeah yeah like, like i said like the ones that i'm i usually do that don't really have any kind of story uh behind them that's usually like when i do that so you know they have like a big size they're not really meant to be functional okay i, I mean when somebody sees some of the the sizes on some of these like some of the raven masks and stuff like that You've got to have a strong neck to be wearing one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that'd be a lot of weight to put on your head. Yeah. Uh, this one, we were discussing this before we started, and, and this one cracked me up because uh, I, I was thinking um, it was a mask from uh, Game of Thrones, and then Guardian of Galaxies came into the equation and everything. This mask is so much different than anything I've ever seen. Can you kind of talk to to us about this one so i don't know i think i just had this idea i think i might have even seen something not just like that but like something along those lines online once and i was like oh it'd be really cool um but the idea comes from uh, an old story about the strong man who got got the supernatural powers where he became like the strongest person on earth and he ended up like wrestling all these people and people just want to challenge him all the time. And it ended up getting to the point where like animals are challenged, him, like grizzly bears and Sasquatch and stuff. And after the animals are done, trees started challenging him. And um, at one point, like the, the, the biggest tree was the red cedar tree. And that's the one that came over to one of the, one of the last groups of people of uh, challengers that would come to him. 
was a was a residue tree and i just thought that's really cool like the idea of like a cedar tree just coming to life you know knocking on his door and hey let's wrestle or something right yeah so uh i wanted just to capture that that's it's really so, neat and then also i just didn't want to i kind of wanted to also do it in a way where um i like the kind of chaos of the bark the outer bark uh and knotty like the burls and stuff so like on his on his uh, cheekbone is like kind of like a burl and then like on his uh chin as well um trying to get it like look relatively like red cedar uh like the way red cedars look and then on the other side of the face is like as if he stripped all the bark right off completely and you just have the natural wood so get rid of the sap wood get rid of the bark and you just have the natural wood yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, the, the top of it to the bottom, I mean, it's just you know, left and right. It's it's really neat. I like it. Yeah, it was interesting because like uh, it's all one piece of wood, too. So like the branches coming off the head, especially on the on the, the bark side, I I didn't. I didn't want to have to have uh, any add any kind of. Uh, like cedar boughs or, or anything like that on there. So I thought of the idea of like, okay, well, I'll just have it looking like, looking like it, like it, like the branches broke. So I had to find a way to make it look like it kind of broke naturally or something. That that was kind of fun. Okay, it was it difficult to carve that part out though without actually breaking them in the process. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it wasn't very really fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really neat piece. Um, well. Uh, We'll move on and just do to time and everything to the, uh, the the final one, which is the the Raven Mask. Yeah, to to help us understand this, I mean, how wide are we talking? Like beak to to back? I mean, uh, th this one is not that big. Like, if you, I think what you're thinking about, like, are these uh, like, yeah. hook masks, like six feet long or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, no, this one is like three feet, I think. It's still long. No, yeah. yeah, it's it's good length. Um, yeah. But it's like pretty. It's pretty light overall. I I tend to hollow out my mask pretty pretty well. Um, so it's about that. I think it might be about ten inches wide by twelve inches tall. Okay. And and this one looks like it uses is that straw on it as well or or what's the uh, uh, material? Cedar bark. Oh, cedar bark. Okay, that makes sense. All right. It, it's neat. Um, I love the uh, the bird masks. To me, they're they're some of the the neatest ones, in my opinion. Just just because of that. There are also the um, the carved hats as well, which you had a couple of photos of on your website. And these to me were fascinating. I can't imagine that as a, a hat that was worn by somebody you know out fishing or or, or harvesting yeah, or something. It would, it would absolutely be like a ceremonial one. Okay. Yeah, actually, I gifted uh, one to. Uh, to a host, a host chief over back home um, in the Halams. Um, I, I did another one. Anyways, I uh, ended up gifting it to one person like that. So he'll, he'll wear it sometimes during during feasts and whatnot. Okay. I mean, they're they're beautiful. Um, trying to th think of the figure. It's a watchman, I think. Uh, when you see them carved, they usually seem to have a, a similar uh, shaped hat on. So yeah. I, I think it's kind of neat. Yeah, traditionally though, those are all uh, cedar bark woven. Well, they're bark, so they're not carved. Then okay. Yeah, yeah. The 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 the, the hat the the hat shape and all that that's that's based off of like those old woven hats. Oh, neat. So this is your interpretation of that. Um, yeah. Well, actually, I didn't carve. I carved. The, I painted, I designed, painted, and carved it, but I didn't actually carve the hat. So a uh, person I know, he he um, he laid it. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, I could see the shape coming off a lathe, and then is is the design that's on it that's painted on then? Painted and carved. Oh, so there was a little bit of carving onto the the lathe out shape. That's, that's fascinating. Um, now the cedar bark hats that weren't like this would that be something that somebody would wear outside to keep the rain off of them? Yes, they would. So there was a functional everyday life hat, and yeah. then a more ceremonial one like these. 
it's neat. Well, I mean, rain's a big part of uh, <laughs> the Northwest in, in that area. Um, yeah. Your, your boxes are, are really neat. And they're, they're, there's a, a box that you fit into a canoe. It's fitted and everything, but it, it's literally, it's sealed. It's watertight. I mean, you can, you know, drop it off into the water and it, it will not leak at least for, you know, a period of time, which I thought was absolutely amazing considering, you know, the tools available and everything else. And yet here they were able to make a, a, a beautiful watertight, um, I think it was called a, a canoe box, if I remember right. It's, yeah. it's a really neat history. Hmm. But in this particular one that you made here, uh, that's a single piece of wood, correct? Um. I mean, at least for the. So I, I didn't actually bend this box itself. Oh, so didn't? I just did the uh, I did the design and the painting. So I have done it myself though. Um, so generally, uh, the outer part is like one single piece of wood. The bottom, like the bottom and the lid, um, are obviously added on. Sure. But yeah, the the four sides of the box is um, all one one plank. Okay, and you've made a, a box like that before. Yes. So, so this is actually. Um, you carve in these like curves on like uh, like a given length away, and the way it comes down, it's like um, you do this like notch here, like like a just like a little U shaped notch, and then you do like an extra one kind of going into one side like that, and then what happens is it kind of bends in and then kind of curls up into itself, and then it locks itself in that place as well. Now, when you do the bending, do you do the carving? Before you bend it or after you bend no, it? No, after you bend it. Okay. Yeah. So you well, shape. because the bending involves a lot of steam. Okay. Would that not be good for your carving? No, it, it really, um, when, when you have steam, well, steam especially, but like if you put water on wood, uh, like grains, it like it soaks up a lot of the water like right away. And then like a lot of the grains will kind of puff up and stuff. And uh -huh. Aesthetically, it just doesn't look that great for me. Okay. Yeah. So you, you steam this, you shape it, you form it, and then you probably let it dry back out again. Yeah. And then you proceed to, to carve it. Yeah. Okay. It's neat. It, it, I had a chance to see one of these. I think it was in the, uh, the Natural History Museum in Victoria. Mm -hmm. When you see, see one of these uh, cedar boxes in person, it, it, it's amazing. It, it's just a really neat piece of art. So. Yeah, they're really cool, man. Um, yeah, even going through going through the process of uh, making it myself with like modern technology and stuff, it, it's pretty wild. Like it's it's a hassle. And then um, if you ever get a chance, there's a video on YouTube that you can probably find. It's of Mongo Martin uh, making a bentwood box, but like like old school style, and it's really really cool. Like he actually. Uh, he um, splits off the plank itself and then he uses it adds to uh, level it out and make it like a nice plank. And then he hand carves all the curves. Then he steams it like the old traditional style. It's really, it's really cool. That would be really neat. And you said his name was Mongo? Mongo, Mongo Martin. Okay. I will have to look that up. That would be really neat to see. Yeah. Uh, in uh, relation to the, the panels we were discussing earlier, the rectangular one and the, the wooden box carving and everything, you have these uh, set of doors uh, on your website. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm kind of curious in that these are, are carved on there. Is the door thicker than normal? Is this a, um, a special, especially created door? Or... Uh, yeah, doors tend to be a little bit thicker. Um, not that crazy, though. I think that was probably like two, two and a quarter inch thick or something like that. Oh, so it's not as thick as I thought then. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's it's really neat. Yeah, like I said, I'll, I'll put the, the photo in here. Uh, when you did those, uh, how long did it take to actually carve that out? And not including the design process and everything. I mean, because, I mean, we're talking, what, like six something feet tall and, you know, three, three plus feet wide? Yeah. I think they're about seven feet. Seven feet. Really, I don't remember. That was a long time ago that I did that door. Oh, it doors. was okay. Yeah. Do you it probably probably was at that time because I was really fast. Probably it was like a month. 
Oh, wow. Okay. Do you make a lot of doors or is it a, a rare project? Uh, I don't know. I've done a good handful of doors. Um, I'm actually, I, I'm looking at a blank that I'm going to start on in next month uh, right now. So, um, yeah, I guess I do. I'm, actually, how many have I done? I've probably done like seven, eight doors. Okay, but over 23 years, I would say that's maybe not a lot then. Yeah, yeah. not. And, and then I, I've got to ask you about this Telus Garden piece because a, a that's not wood, is it? It's the big um, like television panel. Yeah, it's uh, copper. Copper, okay. Now, yeah. how did you make that though? Because, I mean, did you do the same process? Did you sketch it out on your, your phone and then on the paper or? No, uh, okay, so... Full disclosure about that one is that I didn't have any anything to do with the actual process of fabrication. So I I was working with a fabricating a, a metal fabrication company that was able to do this because I would not trust myself to do any of that. That's all like laser laser uh, CNC or whatever. And um, yeah, yeah, uh, no. So what I did was they gave me the dimensions. I drew it up and they kind of told me like what what I can do with it because they wanted to do like layering and stuff with it because yeah. and uh, I messed around with it for a little while and then kind of I don't know I've never designed like this before so I just kind of kind of ran with it and uh, used a light table so I could separate the, the actual forms and then had my friend vectorize the, uh, the designs and then hand it off to the fabricators and then they did the rest. It's it's amazing because when you look at it, it looks like it's it is it looks like it's layered. It it looks like there's different levels to it, like that one yes. uh, panel you're talking about. How it's stepped down, but this is like front and back and middle and yeah. So the very back, so there's three layers. The very back layer is 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 uh, directly glued to the back of the, uh, the metal metal casing. Okay. And then the next layer is probably like inch inch and a half stepped up. From that and then the next one is about the same the same uh distance from that one that, that's so neat and you said it was made out of copper that was cut yes wow. so there's regular sheets of copper but they treated them with um certain types of acid or certain types of uh i forget what they call it but it oxidizes in a certain way where you get these different types of colors stuff certain chemicals Ah, okay. So that explains the the color changes. It's just, it's amazing. Out of curiosity, how much does that thing weigh? Oh, I have no idea. I didn't have to handle it. So, but it, it looks yeah. heavy to me, though. Yeah. Probably yeah, badly. Uh, that is really cool. I, I like that. Do you do you think you're going to do more types of um, applications like that, or or do you want to more st stick with carving? Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Um, I've, I've talked to them before after well, after that and kind of expressed my desire to try something someday down the road, just never really got around to it. Right now, there's a possibility that I might have a, a project where I'll do a set of like really large doors with this same kind of concept. So It'd be beautiful. We'll, we'll I, I, when you do that, please send me a photo because <laughs> I would love yeah. to see it. <laughs> It's amazing, but I, I've never been to this building in Vancouver, but um, within that, you also did the staircase. So if anybody happens to go there and see this, um, it's a spiral staircase and it's really wild. What is the, um, the edge, the material, is it glass or is it wood or? Metal. Or another metal project. Yeah, I think it was metal. Yeah, yeah it was metal, some sort of metal. Okay. The, um... No, the way that they did it, it's just, it was just this spiral staircase that they did. And um, yeah, it, it was metal. So I remember them talking about that. That was like a hell of a thing to, to construct because they had to like get it formed and then they'd have to like crane it in through the roof <laughs> and and get it in there as the whole thing is being constructed. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So what they just, they just had it all there and then they just wanted to find somebody to... Uh, do a design on it and i was they they had a gallery that i worked with um that was working with their art director and so he suggested a couple artists and i think 
I don't know if they went with me or whatever, but I ended up getting it. And yeah, that was uh, quite the quite the project to do. Okay, so this was a big um, spiral staircase that they, they craned in there, they set in there, but at this point it wasn't um, etched or, or painted yet. It was just a... No, no. So when, when it came down to it, um, they got somebody to um, do the base coat, which is like why it's kind of gray on the background. Okay. So the base coat was like a light gray. And then I was going to use like a darker gray or I think it was a darker gray or a blue. I don't know. Oh, no, it was a darker gray. But it so, looks kind of blue. Um, and yeah, so I was doing a kind of a monotone thing and, uh, yeah, I was gonna, one idea I had was I would just kind of freehand the design on there. Um, but we ended up going with, uh, getting it, getting it all vectorized and having this, uh, mural crew, uh, apply the design for me. And that ended up being kind of a nightmare itself because there was so much going on in my life at the time. And I was really, really busy and, they're trying to get it going as quickly as possible and to make certain higher ups happy. And I was like, okay, let's, let's just do it. And um, so they gave me the uh, blueprint uh, specs of what the staircase would look like flat. So I designed in that and uh, within that, and then I sent it to my guy to get vectorized. And so with the vector file, the, the, Mural crew uh, projected it onto like a large ass piece of paper, perforated the edges, like the design, like with a little, I forget what they're using, and brought it in there. And I had to be there during that day. And they're like, so I was there, all kind of getting ready. The, the way that they do it, I guess, is like this old trick of using like chalk, and it would chalk all those like little perforated holes along the design. And then you, did, you could just kind of draw from there. Okay. So essentially, we get your entire design on there, but you, you'd have to like do a little bit of touch-ups or whatever. Um, ended up being way worse than I thought. Just the way that they didn't follow the lines properly at all, mm -hmm. and I ended up having to like redraw so much. It was really crazy. But that wasn't even the worst part. But the worst part was like when we got there, they laid it out over the entire thing, and they're like, "Oh, shit! This this is not matching." Like, this does not fit. Yeah, I can see like, that. Yeah. What? Okay. <laughs> and then there's like literally like a foot on both the top and bottom of a extent of extra paper that you couldn't really deal with. And I remember it was just like, oh my God, this is crazy. Like, what the hell? And somebody explained it was like, oh yeah, you know what? It I guess what happens, it usually happens is that the designer of the staircase will give somebody the blueprints of like what they should do. And then the people that actually make it won't might either just say, yeah, screw that. We'll just make it like our way. Or most of the time it's just not feasible doing it the way that the designer did it. And then they have to make modifications. Oh no. And those don't so get that, updated. <laughs> no, we did not update that at all. So I remember we we're sitting there and I'm just like, Whoa. I mean, I give up, man. Like at the time, it was the most hectic, one of the most hectic times of my life. And then that happened. And I remember this one guy's like, hey, well, what do you think about this? He's trying to like make make it happen. Like, you know, we could we could probably still make it happen. Let's just like kind of like, and he folded in like the, the center part of it or something. He's like, yeah, like we just do this, right? And I'm like, I didn't want to say anything. Luckily, like the main mural guy is like, dude, you can't just fold it in. What are you talking about? You're going to cut half of it like a, section of a design off in the middle of it like are you crazy like oh thank you i didn't have to say anything um so what they ended up doing was they it was hilarious is they got like a big uh, big piece of paper um tr uh, draw, uh trace the uh edges of the whole thing and then brought it to their studio laid it all down do all the measurements put it onto a, a file and then print it out, send it to me, and then I could modify the design to fit to that new shape, and then it ended up fitting there perfectly. Oh, wow. How long did it take them to actually do the mural? Do you remember? I mean, it was literally all day for a, a crew of these people to put that on there? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, they, they're they there for, like, maybe half an hour the first time. They just knew that, like, oh, this isn't going to work, so, okay, bye. <laughs> bye. Then, uh, oh, so the inside of the spiral, um, 
Okay. They did end up doing something because it did kind of fit, sort of, but they had to chop it up a little bit. So I was like, okay, just do that so I can at least get started. And then we'll wait for the other side. So when they came in for the other side, they li- they're there for like an hour. That, yeah. That, all it took them was an hour on the outside. Yeah, they just laid it out, taped it on there, went over there with the little bags of chalk and rolled it up and left. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, when you see a, this picture, it's... Uh, yeah, I was trying to visualize how you took something that was flat and like two dimensional and applied it to a, a three dimensional, and your your, your curve and accounting for the uh, the fact that the people who made the staircase didn't exactly follow the <laughs> directions. Yeah, no, it was uh, no that that was an interesting uh, experience for that just to get it started, and then painting the thing was like whew, that was a hell of a time. I never never had any desire to do a mural before like whatsoever and i still don't <laughs> it's like the idea of like painting on that scale and kind of standing up and kind of contorting your body to the it's something that's stationary like i like moving some like my pieces around right or being able to like lean over it or you know get like a lot of angles on it but if it's just a wall it kind of sucks but the inside spiral of it was the the worst part of it all because well one the design went all the way to the bottom. So I had to be like lying flat on the ground and trying to paint and get these perfect lines and stuff. Um, and then two was trying to get like a, a ladder that was the right size to be able to go all the way up as well. So I had to get like a few different ladders. And then at the end, I had this one long ladder that I had to go up and paint from. And it wasn't very stable. and It was this whole thing freaking mess we had to work at night because they didn't want us there during business hours and um yeah it was we had to clean up after we were all done and put the ladders away and it was just this whole thing and it was very looking back on it some of it was pretty dicey like we didn't have proper anything for for doing it we didn't have any scaffolding whatsoever so yeah all right so this is a big osha violation all right (laughs) oh yeah. yeah 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 I just laugh because it's going to make me appreciate art when I go into buildings more when I think about how that person, you know, actually put it in there and everything in and then think of the story behind it. And I'm just going to be laughing when I see stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, the best, the best story like of that type of thing is like the Sistine Chapel, right? Like everybody's kind of blown away by like how he's able to do it. And you know, it's difficult, but then when you actually read a lot of the accounts of Michelangelo during those years that he was doing it, it was like absolute torture to the guy. Like, I think he, I, I don't remember for sure, but I think he even comp- contemplated suicide a few times. Just because, <laughs> just the immense difficulty of the entire thing and how it just ruined his life and stuff. <laughs> it's just like, it was just like, oh, I could, I could, I could, like, on a very small scale, I could kind of relate, relate to that feeling. Oh, I'm glad you chose a smaller project then. <laughs> yeah, God. That's amazing. These uh, last two works of art, I mean, they're just fascinating in what they are. But do you do you think you're going to try like d- different things in the future? Or do you want to stick mostly with like wood and carving, or kind of what? what where do you think you're going to be going with the stuff? I'm. I don't know exactly. Um, I'm definitely like wood is my absolute my 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 true love. Like I I don't think I could ever not do wood. Um, one thing I really want to try and make more time for myself is stone carving. Wow. So I have done a few stone carvings. Um, well, I started a bunch, but I really only finished two. And um, I have like a few that are kind of on like in the middle stages or something that I would like to eventually get around to finishing and stuff. And is stone carving part of the, the traditional um, culture of the yes. Oh, it is mostly utilitarian, like ads and like mallets. And, um, I forget what they call it, it's something you can do, but oh, then like uh, balls and the uh, mortar and pestle kind of thing going on. Um, but yeah, sometimes you see these old bowls and then you'd have like a design carved into it, or wow. um faces carved in stuff like 
like really really cool intricate stuff that's carved into the to like some thing that's kind of difficult is that they don't know what type of stone it is uh so right. it's hard to really tell but some of them are definitely like really really heavy hard hard stones um we have two examples of masks that were uh found in found with Simpson people that that are in a couple of museums right now that are that were stone oh wow I, I never realized the mask was made out of that so that's that's neat yeah yeah for sure um yeah yeah so most people most people don't know uh that that's a part of the history and stuff so and I think a lot of people kind of I remember they they think it's more um like our involvement with stone was probably more like uh like rock carvings kind of thing right just kind of like geometric uh not geometric but like just really simple designs and stuff which are which was there's quite a bit but there's a lot more sculpture than people think like really good intricate sculptures that's neat yeah, it's not something I, I think of but that may be my ignorance as well so uh that's neat so you, you want to get into that a little do you think you're going to incorporate more machinery more computer design or do you think you're going to stick with the like the phone and the paper um i'd like to um as much as i can like uh i'm i'm always like open to like try something new um i like there's only so much i really want to do though like i want to still like i'm a sculptor like i like that's what i really think of myself like I, i'm a sculptor i'm a carver um I always want to be able to like work with my hands and create something. So I don't know, like I'm, there's definitely room for it for my career and my life, but I'm always going to be, I'm always just going to be a sculptor. Do you, do you think there's a, uh, I mean, when you think of like power tools and hand tools, you know, kind of, you know, some people, you know, prefer the, the one versus the other. Do you think there's something lost in, in not using your hands in that? Power tools? Yeah, I mean, like if you use like a laser cutter instead of carving it uh, out. Yeah, I think in in some ways, like there's certain things that you can't do with a laser cutter. Um, there's certain cuts. I mean, maybe I don't know. Maybe maybe there's like new technology that makes it like a lot easier. But there's certain things like um, I don't know if you uh, are up on really really. Uh, look up a lot of the good like metal engravers like in the Northwest Coast, uh, native artists. But there's certain cuts that they do that really, it, it's it's basically like the way that you would carve the designs in wood, but they do it in silver. And I just don't know if like you can really get that from a CNC or a laser cutter or whatever like that. Okay. I mean, the reason why I ask is somebody out there was uh, doing glass form line etching, which I mean, makes a, a beautiful, you know, visual uh, effect, uh, it, amazing. But I, I'm pretty sure that was machine done rather than and by hand. Oh, yeah. But they still had to design it and everything else. Yeah, I think some people might cut it out themselves, whatever. But like the actual, like the rubber resist. But when it comes to the actual etching, you use like a sandblaster. Yeah, it, it makes for a beautiful effect, no question. I just want yeah. to pick on that. Uh, after all of this, um, if you were talking to somebody out there, you're talking to the young version of you, and they were interested in getting started doing this, what would you tell them to, to do? What would be your advice to them? Um, I guess it really would depend, like, like what they wanted out of it. Okay. Yeah, I think that, that it, sometimes it really depends. Like, one... One of the main things I would tell them to is just find as many people to learn from as possible. And two is if you really want to be good at it, if you really want to like, if you have aspirations to be really good at it and you want it to be like the main part of your life, then make sure that you're passionate about it. Like really passionate about it because you you need that to be able to get through like the hard times and a lot of the mundane parts of this uh this craft or this art because some sometimes um a lot of times it's not very fun 
I think that's what it's like for a lot of artists, you know, like, especially if you kind of do some of the same type of stuff, especially with Carver, because finishing is some of the most boring. It's, it's, it's so boring. It's unbelievably boring because it you're, there's not a lot of creativity in it, right? Especially if you start getting better, you spend more time finishing and less time sculpting because you get better at sculpting, so you're able to get through it faster. And then you get better at finishing, so you spend a lot more time doing that. So most of my time, like whenever I do a project, especially with it when it comes to sculpting or any kind of carving, the fun is over in like two, three days. And then you got like, I don't know, two weeks to three weeks of just uh, really like a lot of intricate carving. Okay, now I'm starting to understand what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. In that case, you need apprentices. You hand that stuff yeah. off to them and say, <laughs> <laughs> "Pretty much." But, but I mean, in the beginning, the, that's the thing, though. Is like in the beginning, there's so much, so much joy in all of it, and there's a lot of fear when it comes to like the finishing and stuff like that too, because you're never, you're not going to be very good. Um, there, you're, you're, you're too. You're too young, you're too ignorant to really know that you're not that good. So you just, you have so much fun and you just kind of like, you're learning all the time. You're, you know, you're constantly getting these big boosts of, uh, of joy just because you're trying something you've never done before and you're able to execute it. You're, you're feeling really creative, right? And um, yeah, that slowly goes away over, over time um, because yeah like you if you do it enough you're eventually it's gonna become like riding a bike and the if you're not learning all the time then it's it's not quite as enjoyable okay but i mean like it's funny like i say like it's i sound really depressing there but i i like i love carving you know i this is like i love this life you know i'm not and because because I, I do want people to understand that it's not all sunshine and rainbows it's uh it is a hard life it can be a very hard life for a lot of people and it's um but if you really love it if you're really passionate about it it's so rewarding this wasn't in my original thought process but how long do you think it took you to get to the point where you could actually feed yourself from your art uh it was about four well, you know what? It really depends because there was there was a small point uh, point in time where I I, I refused to sell anything because I wanted to get make sure that I got good enough to the point where I could start selling without too much hassle of like haggling or being rejected. So I did sell like a few plaques in the early days where I was able to like maybe make like 40, 50 bucks or something like that. Um, but really, when I actually started selling to the galleries, I never stopped. And that was about four, between four and five years okay. after it started. I just wanted to put that out there so somebody would kind of have an idea as to the, um, the time input involved in what you had to, to do to get there. Yeah, you know, I was lucky. You know, I was still living with my family. I was 15 when I started. 19 or 20 when I started actually making money. And then, but, yeah, sorry. And now you have, you know, your, your art displayed in a, a building in Vancouver um, on an Olympic uh, helmet during the, the winter Olympics. I mean, it's amazing to see where you've gone. So I, I think it's fascinating. And I just want to say thank you for, for joining me tonight. It was great to hear uh, your story and your background. Loved it. Thank you. Thank you.